business have ended in Parliament and as we try to do semi-regularly at the end of them, uh, we'll explore the opposition's tactics and priorities with Liberal frontbencher and manager of opposition business in the House, Paul Fletcher. He joins us live in the studio now. Welcome back just on superannuation options. It's very speculative and early days at the moment, Paul, but we are seeing Stephen Jones backing in some suggestions about bequeathed or be, uh, yeah, bequeathed uh, superannuation and the taxation treatment of it. The coalition already supports dipping into super for housing. It would only be a small step for you, wouldn't it, to support some of these potential options? Well, let's be clear. Labor has already introduced one additional tax on super. Uh, the new additional 15% on top of the first 15% for super savings of a, above a threshold. Even though Mr Albanese and Mr Chalmers before the election said there'd be no change to the super taxation. It's actually pretty troubling to see Stephen Jones, the Minister with Responsibility, appearing to entertain the suggestion from an advocacy group, advoc advocacy yep. group that there should be now some kind of additional specific tax on your super balance in retirement towards aged care. Look, we, I think everybody understands that it's important to look at how aged care uh, is funded, uh, but the idea that there should be a specific additional tax on superannuation, well, uh, Labor promised there would be no super additional super taxes. They've broken that promise once. It would be a very bad thing indeed if they broke it again. Yeah, all right. We don't have anything really concrete to uh, explore further with you there. We will when the task force reports, I imagine. Plenty of questions asked in Parliament this week about the voice and an extension of it through to treaty processes. In asking that questions, are, are those questions, are we entitled to assume that the coalition would be imposed to Makarata or truth processes and then ultimately treaty processes if the voice is successful? Well, look, what we've been doing this week is asking a series of questions about the voice, how it would work, but also about uh, the other elements of the Uluru Statement from the Heart because uh, Labor went to the election on a promise and the Prime Minister said it many times, 43 times I think, that he's committed to implementing what's called for in the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. So that includes not just uh, establishing the voice in the Constitution but it also includes the establishment of a Makarata Commission uh, that would oversee a process of treaty making and so-called truth telling. So why is that controversial? Well, why what, is it worth asking questions? So about? what we're wanting to do is use question time for precisely its intended purpose, to ask the government to explain to the parliament and ultimately to the Australian people exactly how this is going to work. What exactly will the Makarata Commission do? Uh, we know that there's been $5.8 million of funding already provided. We've been asking what this money is being used for, but also the treaty process. How long will it take? Uh, will there be uh, payments involved? Will the Commonwealth, will taxpayers, will landowners be um, uh, on the hook for those payments? And of course, we continue to ask for questions about how the voice as a mechanism is going to operate because right. the amount of detail has been very scant. But if you're opposed to the voice, well, mm. you are, does that mean you would then be opposed to reparations and treaty processes? And let's be clear in terms of the voice. Uh, we don't support the voice being entrenched in the Constitution. We do support constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. That's been our long-standing position. We also support local and regional voices and that being implemented by legislation. That could be done quite quickly and that would allow the focus to be where it should be on people on the ground in communities, uh, in many cases a very long way away from Canberra, mm. having the opportunity to communicate their message uh, to government about issues of concern to them. So those are the things uh, we support. But what we've been asking questions about about are what are the details of the government's agenda here because Australians are going to be asked reasonably soon to vote in a referendum. Yeah. So we're committed to Australians being as well informed as possible. Can I remind you that uh, there is ordinarily a requirement in for referendums that there be a pamphlet setting out the yes case and the no case. The original proposal from the government late last year, really this year, was oh we didn't even need to do that this time. Oh yeah, but that was negotiated out. It, it getting, was, yeah. it was, but my point is that was an example of our commitment to Australians being fully informed about the important decision they have to make, as indeed is the process we've been going through this week of asking yeah. questions. All right, many uh, government Dorothy Dixer questions about robo debt, obviously trying to drive home the point that Scott Morrison is struggling to rise above his record on robo debt as social services minister, and uh, maybe the implication is subsequently as prime minister. Is his legacy being tarnished the longer he stays around in this parliament? Uh, look. 
How long Scott Morrison chooses to stay around is entirely a matter for him. Scott has given great service to the Liberal Party and to our nation, leading Australia through a very challenging time. Uh, the pandemic, uh, the biggest economic crisis our nation had faced since the Depression. Of course, Australia emerged from the pandemic uh, with one of the best public health records and one of the best economic outcomes against all the countries we'd normally benchmark ourselves against. None so of which offsets what the Royal Commission found about his time as social services minister. So my point is that Scott Morrison has earned the right to decide how long he should stay. Of course, ultimately, it's the people of Cook mm. who choose who their member is. Uh, it's not Bill Shorten. Now, Bill Shorten, uh, you know, is a very political animal and he's demonstrating that here again. Can I just make the point again, because Mr Shorten has been keen not to emphasise this point, but it was when we were in government... Uh, when it became clear that a legal challenge had been successful, uh, we identified that there was an issue. We reversed all the debts. Uh, by November uh, 2021, uh, almost 99% uh, of uh, all debts had been repaid. Uh, so, yes, uh, we've been clear uh, that... Uh, Australians uh, were subject to things they shouldn't have been subject to. We've apologised. It was a mistake. It was fixed on our watch. All right. Since you referenced the voters in Cook and, and their importance in all of this as a senior New South Wales Liberal, would you see some advantage in coordinating any departure from this parliament with voting day for the voice uh, so as to minimise inconvenience and disruption for voters? Look, I'm not going to speculate on, on hypotheticals in relation to any member of this parliament, uh, Mr Morrison or anybody else. Um, I, I, look, I'm just not going to get into right. that situation. <laughs> I thought you but might say try. that good so, try. somehow. I did. Uh, Home Affairs Contracting, mm. uh, Dennis Richardson has been appointed to review this. How will the Coalition engage in that process? Because I know you were anxious, Peter Dutton said so himself, that it not be restricted to his time sure. as Minister, and yeah. it doesn't appear to be either. So look, and that's important because the arrangements that continued when Peter Dutton was Minister had been in place for many years, including uh, under the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government. Um, can I make the point that, again, in a pretty grubby exercise, Labor has sought to politicise this. Mike Pizzullo, the Secretary of the Department, has stated in a parliamentary hearing that these contracts uh, were not contracts that were signed off on by the Minister. They were signed off on by the Department. That's perfectly routine procedure, particularly with a department as large as Home Affairs. Uh, so, again, this is part of the unfortunate pattern of this Labor government. Far too interested in uh, trying to score political hits based upon things that have happened in the past, rather than yeah. responding to the challenges that Australians are facing, including the serious cost of living challenge. Even if facing. there's not a ministerial scalp to be obtained here, it still could be well worth the time, couldn't it, to examine departmental processes, huge amounts of money went into offshore processing and I think it's fair to say we didn't have full transparency over that across the years. Uh, look, what I would simply say is on our side of politics, of course, we are committed to value for money for taxpayers. Um, but can I say also, uh, our record on border protection was a very important one. Let's not forget, when we came to government in 2013, we inherited a complete mess, some 50,000 unauthorised maritime arrivals, some 1,200 people that are known of tragically yep. died at sea, and that was because of the hopeless mismanagement of this issue under the previous government, of which, of course, Mr Albanese was a, Albanese was a very senior minister. Yeah, it was so we, we fixed a very difficult problem, yep. uh, and... Um, uh, you know, it's very unfortunate that Labor is once again playing political games. Well, let's see where the Richardson inquiry takes us. As you say, uh, it was costly and cumulative over many years. Paul Fletcher, thanks for scrambling up after question time today. Thanks, we'll have Rick. you back again. Good to see you.